I was uh, so fascinated by that that I forgot to turn my computer on. So, Christine, do you want to just uh, share greetings and let them know what we're doing? Um, I love how you said, you know, God's not stale. I, like, I, I think I'm more excited about my faith now at 59 than what I was when I was 21. You know, God is just amazing. Um, 12 months ago, uh, a young evangelist, Maddie Montgomery, um, uh, rang us and said um, if we felt God calling us, uh, they would feel uh, honoured if we would join them in Johnson City, Tennessee, in the work that uh, he and his wife Candace were going to start there. Um, Ian felt God on it. I, I thought he was sweet to ask, but no, why would we go to America? Um, but then, <clears throat> excuse me, at that point, Ian uh, actually did a mission trip to the States and while he was there, he just get, kept getting all these prophetic words from total strangers coming up and, uh, and he would keep sending them home to me and I would get them and think, oh. <laughs> and when he got back, it wasn't a matter of does God want us to go to the States. I'd already worked through... It was a matter when I first heard them as, well, am I going to be obedient? So by the time he got back, it wasn't a matter of discussing any of that. It was, we need to tell the elders because we could see that this was going to happen fast. So we're going to join Matty Montgomery in Johnson City, Tennessee. He, he has an organisation called Awakening Evangelism um, and uh, he tours around the States. Um, he's a young African-American um, man, evangelist, and his wife with young kids, um, and God told him to plant a church in Johnson City. He told him that about 10 years ago, um, but not now, God said, and then last year God said to him, uh, now's the time. So we're joining him there. There will be a church plant. A mission training um, school is going to join him and come under his umbrella, and they've already uh, planted 95 churches. Um, they have already started services in, in their home and they're getting about, well, we know there's 20 kids already, um, so we're assuming there's probably 20 or 30 adults in amongst there. So they're just meeting in their home at the moment. But, you know, it, it, you get to, when you know God has called you, when you know that you know that the the difficulties of leaving family, friends, what is normal, you know that that's the best place for you to be is in God's will. No matter how hard it might be, that's the best place. So I'm going with excitement and I'm ready. I'm ready to go and uh, excited what God's going to do. We don't know what he's going to do, what we will be doing, um, but we're there to make uh, to be mum and dad and to make the vision of Maddie and Candace become a reality. So. Thank you, and thanks for giving me time to just get myself set up. So we meet with the US consulate on Wednesday. You didn't say that bit, did you? Because oh, I wasn't <laughs> listening to everything. I was putting in my, my password. My password is so complicated that I can't listen to anything else. I'm, I'm not good at, at uh, multitasking. Um, I'm not female. Uh, fabulous 40s. I can't tell you where my head went with the 60s, but it worked for me in my head. And no, None of you got that. It's all right. I'll, I won't be invited back if you tried. Um, so... Uh, yeah, we meet with the US consulate on Wednesday. They will give us the visa at that point. US has already said yes, and so it's all go ahead. This time in two weeks, we actually will be in the States. And uh, so see you all. Um, uh, we're doing part of a series here at the moment at, at, uh, at Family Centre um, on relationships and relationship goals and and learning to love God, love people. Um, a classic verse that is a family centre verse because I think it is one of the favourite verses of your senior pastor is 
Mark chapter 12, verses 30 to 31. It's in all the literature. I grew up here in this church. Uh, I didn't get saved here. I got saved in Queensland, but three weeks later, I was down in Adelaide um, doing Tabor Bible College. Uh, within one month, I was in this church. Uh, we weren't here at that stage. We were down at West Beach Primary School. And, uh, and so I've sat in under the leadership of Pastor Bill and the team, and I know all the documents. I've helped proofread half of them. Uh, you know, sitting there with Ian Hunter going through methodically because if there's one thing that your senior pastor is good at, he's good at writing words and lots of them. And, uh, and so, uh, but he's not good at proofing, but that's why he has staff around about who just make it actually look good. Is that true, Ian? Yeah, we, we make him look really good. Um, so, so I can say that because he's just not in the room at the moment. He said he's here in spirit and I'm just a little bit afraid that the Holy Spirit might just let him know, just you need to have a word with this boy. Um, Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest command? And he said this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. He wasn't asked what the second was, but he's going to say it anyway because Jesus knows that if he gives you the answer to what is the greatest command, the greatest command is to love God, he knows that if he doesn't say the second one, you are not going to understand the first one. The second is this. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. Everything toggles around that. Everything sits like, like, it's like, it's like that's one of the major coat hangers of the Bible and everything gets packed in around and hangs on top of that. Two commands. Well, the Bible is full of commands. I don't know if you've ever read it, but there's a ton of commands. Here's, there's a little trouble with it though. And the trouble is, is that we live in the second part of the Bible called the New Testament. The New Testament, it actually doesn't call itself the New Testament. It calls itself the, the covenant of grace. It talks about the Old Testament and it doesn't call itself the Old Testament. It calls itself the covenant of law. There are two big plans in the scriptures where God governs the world. It was always going to be about grace. But he, in the old days, he introduced law, that's Moses and the Ten Commandments and all of the religious rules, all of the celebration rules, the priestly rules, the sacrificial rules, you know, the moral, the moral rules, there was, there was the ceremonial, it's just like, it's, all of that was there to teach us that we can't do it ourselves. Trouble is this, people who love God want to obey him. That's a fair comment, isn't it? I'm assuming that if you're here, you at least have a, a respect for God. If, if you were totally disrespectful of him and you wouldn't, chances are you wouldn't be sitting in this room right now. Okay, so even if you don't know Jesus and you've, you've never given your heart to him, and I'm here to give you some good news, and that is that there is a huge, huge opportunity for you right now at this moment because Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart right now. Don't leave him outside. He's not going to wreck your life, but he will take control of it. So you've got to be prepared when you let him in, he's going to come in. And, oh, that's just a different message altogether. He gave us all of the commands to show us that we can't do it ourselves. You can't make your way to heaven. Sorry, you're just not that good enough. None of us are. The best living person falls short. None of us are strong enough. Okay? None of us are good enough if it came down to that. So God gave us all of the commands to show us that we fall short so that we would look to him for grace. Just free favour. I've got three kids and I'll tell you what, the answer is yes to them. If, if, if I've got the capacity to answer their need, then they don't have to convince me because I love them. 
if they need something, if there's something going on in, on, in their world. One of our sons in, in, uh, in India at the moment, and uh, he works over there. It, the simple truth is, if they need something, the answer is going to be yes, so long as we have the capacity to do that. And it's because he's family to us. But those of you who are mothers and fathers, you know that you, it, it goes more that way, doesn't it? You know, you give more than you get back until you're really, really old and then they have to look after you. And it's just... <laughs> Our younger son, Dan, uh, he's uh, studying to be a lawyer and he said, Dad, Mum, when you get old, I'll look after you. Phil's going to have no money because he's a missionary. Deborah is a florist. I'll look after you. It's like it's all covered. I'm a lawyer, just like it's good. Okay, where am I going with this? I am going somewhere. God wants us to know that it's about grace and favour, not about what you do. So why is what you do so important to us? Why is obedience such a big thing for Christians? To obey is better than sacrifice. We, we sing songs like that. So what is, a, what is the whole deal about obedience? Because obedience is obedience to a command. You do, you, like... So here's a verse that I wanted to just share with you. It's John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus said this, If you love me, you will obey my commands. Fair enough? Okay, now let me just... Uh, uh, who are the Greek speakers in here? Right down the back. It's just like, Greeks should always sit in the front. Just, just you know, it's just like, like the New Testament was written in your language. You know, it's just like, okay, so here's the thing. In the language, I don't know if it's the same in modern Greek, okay? So please excuse this. But in the, in the New Testament, the New Testament Greek, which I understand is a little bit different for you and it's a little bit hard to read if you try and read the original language. Um, but here's the thing. Unlike English, those guys, when they speak... They change the endings of their verbs and the beginnings of their verbs to make their verb do a different thing. And so here's the thing. They can, have, they can make something a command, do this. They can say, they can make it like, you did that. Uh, uh, they can make it say, that was done to you. Like, they, can, they, can, they just change the, the, the way that the word looks, okay? Simple, that's a simple little thing. Here's the thing. The voice of command in the New Testament language, and it would be interesting to know if it's the same in modern Greek, so the voice of command, the imperative, is exactly the same as the future tense. So when Jesus said this, if you love me, you will obey me, you will keep my commands, there are two ways to read it. One is it's an imperative. It's a, it's a, it's a decree. Philip Bryce... If you love me, you will obey me. Or it's a future tense. Phil, if you love me, you'll obey me. It will happen. So one is a command. The other is a promise. And Christians miss this one all the time. Because we want to obey him. But we want to obey him because we love him. Not because he commands us. Teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. That's the Great Commission, isn't it? And I know that's another famous uh, CFC verse. That's on all of your literature as well. Um, it's actually in the Bible. Um, teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. He didn't say, teach them what to obey. He said, teach them to actually obey it. I don't know if you can hear the difference in that. Don't tell them what they need to do. Get them to be people who obey. Show them how to actually obey. How do you obey? Phil, if you love me, you will obey me. In other words, teach them to obey, not teach them all the list of the things that you're supposed to do, because if you do that, that actually is called law. And it, the law will kill you. 
And there are some Christians, I tell you what, they try so hard to love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul and strength and they just shrivel up inside because the harder they try, the harder it is to do it. They try and have their devotions and they make their devotions stricter and stricter and stricter. They're going to get up at 6 o'clock. No, I'm not. that's not good enough. I'm going to get up at 5 o'clock. I find it so hard to do that. I go to sleep in the chair when I'm having my, my, my devotions. So I, I get everything happening and what happens? Suddenly my mind goes, wandering and I'm thinking about something that's happening later on in the day and I'm just and I beat myself up because I'm supposed to be having my devotions I'm supposed to be loving God with all of my heart mind soul and strength and so we try harder and harder and harder and we fast and we pray and we do all the Christian things that are brilliant and we make a job out of every single one of them we sign up for, for church programs and leadership and, you know, we, we do it. We give in the offering until it hurts and, we, it, and there's no joy in any of it. We've lost the first love. The first love, because that's what it was all about. It wasn't about a command. If you love me, you'll obey me. So what is my role as a preacher? My role as a preacher is not to tell you what you ought to be doing. My role as a preacher is to let you know that you're allowed to fall in love with Jesus because he thinks the world of you as you are. Right now, he thinks the world of you. He died for you before you even did anything. He thought you were worth it. Some of you grew up in a Christian home. Some of you didn't grow up in a Christian home. Those of you who didn't grow up in a Christian home, you know some of the mess that you get into. Some of you who grew up in a Christian home got into the same mess as the non-Christian guys in this room. And guess what? While we were still enemies, Christ died for the ungodly. You just can't stop it. He loves you. He loves you, as a friend of mine says, he loves you because he loves you, because he loves you, because he just loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you. That's why, because he loves you. He just loves you. He loves you. And there's not a thing you can do about that. He loves you. He gave his life for you because he loves you. If you love him, if you just stop long enough to love him how do you grow in love like how do you do that bit because I want to do that bit now just like I'll tell you what it's going to mess with you I'm going to ruin I'm going to ruin the Christian family center verse Mark 12 30 to 31 that's on all of your literature I'm going to ruin the greatest command for you I'm going to ruin it right now you're going to look forward to that Because here's how you do it. There's a beautiful verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And it says this, But we all, with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror, I'm going to unpack this in a minute for you, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. I tell you what, There is nothing for you to do. Just look at the one who loves you. Just look at him. Look at him. But I mean really look at him. Look at him. The real him. You're going to have to go. I'll tell you what. If you try and think about who who God is and don't look at Jesus, you will get it wrong. I promise you this. Right around our world, religion is rampant across the globe, the Christian religion included. If we don't look at Jesus, we will get God wrong. We will misunderstand what he's about. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. He didn't see, it's like, this is John chapter one, verse 18. No one has ever seen God except God, the one and only who is in the Father's bosom. He has declared him. No one has ever seen God. And he is saying that in the middle of a world where they're Jewish. 
where they've got Moses in their background, who was on the mountain and came down with the glory of God. How, how God would speak to Moses face to face as a man, as, 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 as you would with a friend. Like, like this is Elijah who would see God pass by. This is Isaiah who in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. This is, this is Ezekiel who has seen him. This is like, this is the whole of the Old Testament all the people who have come face to face and had encounters with the living God and in that environment, John comes up and says, no one has ever seen God. You haven't seen him really until you see Jesus. And then Jesus would later on say, how can you say, show me the Father? Don't you know that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? Don't you realise that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And if you've seen me, you've seen him. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus was saying in that, when you look at me, you will see what God is really like. You go back to Moses and you'll get an image of him and it'll be a good image and it'll be a powerful one. You go to Isaiah, you'll get a great image of God and it'll be a huge one and it'll be part of the truth, but it won't be the full story until you go to Jesus. You've got to look at Jesus. For we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. This is what he wants you to do. He wants you to go to your bathroom, your spiritual bathroom. When I got saved, I used to read King James Bible. Did anyone remember King James? Just like that was the real one, wasn't it? Yeah, just like... And I remember when I read in Matthew's gospel, Jesus saying, when you pray, go into your closet and pray. And uh, Phil, you were in my Bible college class back in those days. Um, I don't know if you realise, but I lived at Tabor in those times. And, uh, and when I read Jesus saying, go into your closet, I actually literally did that. <laughs> so I used to have like a pillow in there and it was one of those L-shaped cupboards that had three drawers and just a single little bit that you could hang a few things. And I would go and I would sit in there and I would pull the door shut and I would just hope that no one just burst into my room because I'm in the cupboard. But I just figured if that's what Jesus wants me to do, then that's what I'm going to do. You think I'm a nut? I'm, I'm here to tell you that Jesus was in the closet. I met him in there. He used to think that was awesome. I've never done it since. But he was there because he loves it. What am I doing? I'm, just, I'm in my closet. I just want to be where he is. And if he's in a cupboard, then I'm going to get in a cupboard. And I don't care what you think. If he's in... If he's in Johnson City, America, Tennessee, that's where I'm going to go because I don't care. I don't, I don't care if Sydney's my home or if Adelaide's my home or Queensland. Right now, my home's in Johnson City, Tennessee. That's my home because that's, for me, that's where Jesus is. And I'm, right now, I'm in the plane waiting to land because I want to go home. Not I want to go home, but... <laughs> go into your prayer closet that you'll find that there's a mirror there. And it's the Lord. It's not your face, it's his face. Here's the thing, when you look at that mirror, you will see him, not you. Religion will show you you. Religion will tell you where you get it wrong. Religion will tell you how bad you are, how unworthy you are, how... how how completely wrong you are and how totally undeserving of God's goodness you are. And religion will tell you why you are not getting healed. Religion will tell you why you're not to expect a miracle of God. Religion will tell you why that God does not intend for you to prosper and flourish. Religion will tell you all of those things because religion will put a mirror up in front of you and as you're in your prayer closet, you don't realise you're not beholding the glory of the Lord. You're not beholding the one who sacrificed everything to get you. 
You're not looking at the one who thought you were a pearl of great price worth selling everything for. You want to beat yourself up and say you just can't get this Christian deal right. Well, I'm just here to tell you it's impossible to get the Christian deal right. He still loves you. So stop trying and start being. As you behold him, not you. It's not a picture of you. You're going to see him. because It's a mirror. Mirror's supposed to reflect the thing that's in front of them, isn't it? In other words, what he's doing is he's taking you to a mirror and he has become like a projector to shine out of that mirror to show you what you're supposed to be seeing. You're supposed to be seeing him. When you look in the mirror, you're supposed to see the image of God. You're supposed to see a glorious human. You're supposed to see someone who is created in the image of the maker. You're supposed to see someone who is loved by Father God. You're supposed to see somebody who is seated in heavenly places. You're supposed to see someone who has been granted power and authority. You're supposed to see someone who has the sword of the Spirit in one hand and the shield of faith in the other. That's what you're supposed to see. You're supposed to see a warrior, someone who stands in faith and believes. You're supposed to see someone who is above and not below, the head and not the tail. You're supposed to see that person. You're supposed to see someone who is blessed when they go in and blessed when they go out, blessed when they wake up in the morning, blessed when they go to bed at night, blessed in all of their deals. Here it is. We get caught up in all of the stuff. Biggest issues in planet Earth are all about relationships. They are all about inter- like marriage problems and problems with kids and problems with the neighbours. And, and if you go into a global scale, then it's problem between nation and nation. We, like we have all of these dysfunctions on this level. The problem is this one. The problem is here, not here. If there's relationship breakdown breakdown happening all around about you, I guarantee if you dig deep enough, you'll start to discover that here's where the problem is. Somewhere along the line, someone is not seeing. They're not looking at that image. And they're seeing stuff that they're not supposed to see. When you stand in front of God's mirror in his closet, he's going to project onto you. He's going to transform you from glory to glory. But we all with unveiled face, take the, take the veil off. You're allowed to be you. Here you go. I'm not your pastor, but I'm going to give everybody in this room permission to be themselves. As obnoxious as you might be, because I'm going to leave and go to America. And Cass has to deal with it. Just <laughs> Pastor Chris, he's Greek. He'll deal with it. He will deal with it. Just Is, are you, is he around here somewhere? Or did he run away? Oh, he's over there. Just like, I just want to be careful right now. We all with unveiled face. Take the veil off. This is family, guys. This is home. These people around about you. This is not a club. Don't treat this like a club. This is family. Some of you, are, some of you it's just like your, your home that you grew up in is just so dysfunctional and broken. Guess what? There are mums and dads in this room. Look to them. Treat them well. There are other people, like, you don't choose your family. Every family's got the odd person in it, don't they? Like, in my family, I am probably it. (laughs) And I'll tell you what, within the family, everyone will joke about the family. But if someone outside the family has a go, I'll tell you what, watch it. 
I'll, ha- I'll, have, I'll have a shot at my little sister, but I remember when she was attacked by somebody and my brother went round there because he's going to have it out with that guy. Like, don't you touch my sister because like, we're family. Families are where you're known. Families are where you're known. Families, we don't care what you do in families, do we? I'll tell you what, in my family, I am not impressed by how smart or clever they are or not. I'm just not impressed by what they do. Like, I mean, I love what they do, but I'm not impressed by it I, because I actually know them. My kids are not impressed by me. You all think that I'm just absolutely stunning and amazing <laughs> and, and, and I will say I'm... Fabulous 40s, and I am in the sexy 60s. Just like, but my kids, they are not impressed like you're impressed because they actually know me and they love me still. In a club, Port Power, Adelaide Crows, what do you guys hear? Just, just, you, you, well, okay, I'm just going to start a, a civil war here. I better be careful. I'm going to a place where that has had ramifications. Um, It's true, isn't it, Dan? Okay. In a club, you are celebrated for your abilities and your gifts. Oh, you got the McGarry medal. Oh, you you kicked six goals. You know, in 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 a club, you are celebrated for what you do, but in a family, you're celebrated for who you are. Totally different. Totally different. These people in this room, they are not impressed by how clever you are. That's actually a great place where you can bring the veil down. But you will never know that until you meet with them and live with them. Now, like, I don't, I'm sure you do small groups here. I'm sure you do like festival of food and stuff like that. If you do not take part in stuff like that, you are never going to know these people. You will just be a club. And all you will see in the people around about you is their gifts and abilities. And the chances are in a church this size, the only gifts and abilities you're going to see are the people in the front row. And I'll tell you what, God is not impressed by the front row. He loves them for who they are. Front row, back row, it's all the same for him. He loves it all. He loves you. You've got to be involved in stuff, guys. Not involved to do but because you're, you're, you've got the veil down and you get to see in the mirror. And when you see in the mirror, you're seeing a reflection, not of you, but you're seeing the reflection of who Jesus created you to be. And it looks like him. When he looks at you, he sees the real you. He sees the born again you. He sees the recreated you. He doesn't see the fallen Adam you. He sees the risen Jesus you. That's who he sees. He sees you full of power, authority, truth, grace, forgiveness, love, compassion, joy. He sees, that's how he sees you. He sees you as somebody who has their mind controlled. He sees you as being a a person who walks in righteousness and dignity. He sees you as, as a person who is not afraid. He sees you as a person who is full of love full of mercy. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require? That's Old Testament. That's rules. Here's the thing. Look at him and this is how you will see yourself to love. Shown you what what does the Lord require? But to do justly. He sees you as someone who does the right thing. To love mercy. He sees you as somebody who just loves mercy. You're just free with your forgiveness. You don't hold grudges. That's who you are and who walks humbly with your God. You just, you're not the big shot. It's not about you. You realise that it's not about you. You're just so, so amazed that you get to see the king when you look in your mirror and you are transformed by that. That's going to mess with you. That's going to mess with you that the way you get transformed, the way you outwork the great commandment, 
Love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. And the second like it, love your neighbour as yourself. The way you actually get that one right is look at Jesus. Just stand in front of the mirror. Stand in front of the mirror long enough to get transformed by the image that's in the mirror. Stop looking at yourself through the lens of religion. Stop looking at yourself through the lens of command and law and start looking at yourself through the eyes of God's incredible, passionate love for you. And you will be transformed by the Spirit. He just does it. And I said, that's going to mess with you. Because if you think it's all about performance, I just told you there is not a thing you can do about it. You can't obey that command. Sorry. It's not going to happen. Oh, yeah, you, you, you'll get a few things. I'll tell you what, you will look good on the outside. But Jesus sees behind the veil. He's going to see what's buried down underneath there and all that junk that's in there. Just, just drop it. Will you just drop it? Stop trying. Start being. Love him because he loves you. I want to pray for you. Lord, I just want to thank you that you have great, great, incredible love for us. Your mercies are new every morning, every single morning. I want to thank you that there is nothing that we are not defined by what we do. We're not defined by our mistakes, not in heaven's eyes. I want to thank you, Lord, that you don't judge us according to our deeds, but you extend mercy to us and grace just because of how amazing Jesus is. We want to thank you. Like as we look at the mirror and we see you reflecting back on us, we understand it's not because of us. We, we just want, and we just want to live for you because you're so awesome, you're so incredible, you're so kind, you're so good, you're so loving, so generous to us. You've opened heaven's doors to us. You've invited us to sit at your table. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. One thing have I sought, this will I look for, that I might behold the face of the Lord in his temple, that I might inquire of him, because we know that, Lord, you will lift us up. In the day of trouble, you will be a tower around us and a rock underneath us, and we just want to thank you for it. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And for those of us, I want to pray for those who are having troubles at home, troubles in the workplace, trouble in the neighbourhood, troubles with the extended family, troubles in their community. Maybe you're living next door to like, you know, a drug house or something like that. Jesus loves those people. You realise that? They're just not looking at the right mirror. And Jesus doesn't judge people don't think that he came into the world to judge the world, but he came into the world to save the world. And if you are living in a place of horror, if you're living in a place of mayhem, if you're living in a place of broken, dysfunctional humanity, then I am here to tell you that you are doing exactly what Jesus did. He came into our broken, dark world to save our broken, dark world. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Be like the one that you're seeing in the mirror. Reflect him to the community around about. Don't judge the person next door, but love the person next door. Jesus was the friend of tax collectors and prostitutes. He got a bad reputation for it. You allow yourself to have your reputation sullied by those who don't get it because you care for the people who live in your street. Don't judge them. Don't be the one out the front placating against them. Jesus, we love you. We want to live for you. We want you to reign supreme in our families. We want our lost children, our lost parents, our lost aunts and uncles to come back to you. We want you to 
reign supreme in our workplaces. We want them to come back. We want them to come to you. Our suburbs, we want them for Jesus. We want a great revival. God, we don't want a big church. We want a big community. We want a kingdom. We don't want a club. We want a family. We want a family where people prosper and find their future and hope and destiny and dignity, where they start to see that there is a reflection in front of them and they pull down their veil and they look with honesty and and openness. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Just this morning, 1.45 a.m., I have people on my Facebook who come from all over the world. Had someone write a message to me. Does the online doctor have any words for my lungs? Pneumonia and bronchitis keep coming back. It's been years with this happening. I saw it at 7.52. And I I, 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 I said to them in brackets, I said, look, this is going to sound corny, but this is what I hear heaven saying. I wrote this, just consulted the chief surgeon. He says it's all covered by your redemption insurance that he purchased for you. Keep believing, stay encouraged and develop expectation by giving thanks. They wrote back to me almost straight away. I just just felt my left lung open. Right then after I read, it's felt painful to breathe in all night. I'd started thinking maybe my lung was collapsed. It was so painful with shallow breathing. I feel like I'm breathing 80% now. Thank you, Lord. I, I just want you to know that that's who you are because it's who Jesus is. He, he, he doesn't see the impossibility. He sees the possibility. I feel like I want to do something just a little bit different. You were going to ask me to do this later on, I know. But... Like, I know that many people in this room, I know you guys love Pastor Bill, okay? I know he's, he's an amazing leader, and I know he's larger than life, and I know that you miss him when he's not here, and I know that some of you are really worried for him, and I know that some of you are really struggling within your heart because can you believe, and you're just scared whether or not, you know, how this is it going to outwork. And I've, and I've come here to tell you that there's been a word spoken over Pastor Bill. And that word is this. It comes from, from John chapter 11. This is not unto death. So whether you, whether you struggle to believe that or not, I'm just here to tell you that that's what God is saying right now. It's not unto death. He's not going to die. Some of you, you're sitting there and you're just thinking, oh, like just, it doesn't always come have the fairy tale ending, Ian. I'm just letting you know that there were people in John chapter 11 when Jesus first said that who felt exactly the same as you and still the miracle happened. Because when Jesus said, this is not going to end in death, he actually meant it. He was just telling you the truth. This is not going to end that way. Therefore, If the redemption insurance is paid in full, then this is covered. This is covered. It's covered by what Jesus bore on the cross. He paid for it all. By his wounds, we have been healed. If you're struggling to believe that, I'm just here to tell you right now, you know what? I understand. But be thankful anyway. And give a sacrifice of praise, even when you feel the conflict in your own heart. Because I'm here to tell you this right now, that if you will look at that mirror, you will see an awesome, risen, powerful, conquering king there in that image. And he has no problem with any of the issues that any of us face. He is master of it all. He has the name that is above every name. There is not one thing that he cannot do. All things are possible with him. 
He is powerful, He's mighty, He's in control. He is never looking for a second, a second option. He's got it all worked out and He is, knows how to make glory out of anything. He knows how to make glory out of your life. He's m- making glory out of this one. You watch to see what He does. It is going to be exciting and I'm going to hear the praise stories when I'm in America because you guys are going to be posting them on your Facebook and Instagram. And he's going to be up here preaching and he's going to have that big lectern that's up here. What are you facing? Because I'm here to tell you it's not to death, but for the glory of God. Do you need some prayer? Then stand up out of your seat. If you need some prayer, then get out here right now. It's open right now.